Hi guys, this is a um, double lecture on reproductive disease and disorders and pregnancy. So we're going to cover two chapters, chapters 25 and 26, which makes it a little bit longer of a lecture. So uh, if you need to pause it, obviously feel free to do so. Uh, and um, that can help you, you know, with all that. All right, so we're going to start with reproductive diseases and disorders, which is chapter 25. And we're going to start with the female um, reproductive system, so um, the structure and function. The components of the female reproductive system are the ovaries, <clears throat> the uterine tubes, the uterus, the cervix, and the vagina. The um, reproductive tract is separate from the urinary tract, which is not the same in the males. And um, the development of the egg starts in the womb. So this means that when a woman is pregnant with a baby girl, the baby girl's eggs are being um, formed uh, right then in the womb and so um, what a woman does and how she takes care of her body could potentially affect the health of her grandchildren because her daughter's eggs are being formed at the time which is interesting to think about uh, and um, after birth the ovum development st stops um, usually um, once they're born um, a baby girl has about a million primordium follicles, so basically early eggs. And um, then when she reaches puberty, which is when the egg development um, starts again, uh, she's actually down to about 400,000 um, eggs. And then um, she will actually only release anywhere between four and 500, depending on how many cycles she has, but that's the average number of periods a woman would have during reproductive years. The um, gonadotropin releasing hormones uh, produced by the pituitary, uh, by the I'm sorry, hypothalamus that go to the pituitary um, are is what triggers the menstrual cycle to start. So uh, they start producing these gonadotropin releasing hormones, which will create LH and FSH to be released in a certain pattern that we're going to look at. So um, this ovulation and ovulation basically if you're in your reproductive years that means and you're going through a cycle means you, usually you're ovulating uh, but there are some instances where there could be no ovulation um, and obviously um, before that before a woman enters her reproductive cycle there is no ovulation and then when she ends and enters into menopause there's no ovulation also um, and we're going to look at some of this so let's review a little bit um, how this is and let me see if I can actually move this frame slightly down I want to see there you go those days here okay so this is the hypothalamus um, and it's going to produce a gonadotropin releasing hormones and go to the um, anterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary is going to start releasing LH and FSH so FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone and LH stands for luteinizing hormone and so um, what happens is you have, uh, this is how at first it affects the ovary and the prom prom promoted follicles and uh, the follicular development. So as uh, FSH is produced, um, the follicle stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the development of the follicles. It is also going to cause estrogen here to start climbing. As estrogen climbs, the follicles here develop and the estrogen peaks here at the full full maturation of the follicle and when there is this surge of LH and this little dip and then surge in FSH there's, usually, there's ovulation which is release of the egg and uh, that egg then would have to for pregnancy would have to be fertilized within just a few days um, this surge and release of eggs happens about on day 14 of the cycle if you count uh, day one as uh, the first day of menstrual bleeding okay so another thing that estrogen does as it climbs up here and matures up the follicle is estrogen also contributed to um, after the, the menses, the period bleeding it contributes to this rebuilding uh, this proliferation of the wall of the uterine uh, uterine lining okay so back to ovulation here and the surge mid cycle surge of LH and FSH which signals ovulation and then both um, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormones kind of just their levels drop back down a little bit 
And the hormone that's going to start climbing is progesterone. So progesterone was pretty low early in the cycle. And then after ovulation, progesterone starts to climb and it's going to surpass estrogen here, um, right here. And so estrogen is going to still kind of be maintained because it's trying to maintain its uterine lining. And then if there is no fertilization that happens in this phase here, right here, then uh, basically the body's going to wait and see for a little bit when uh, with this progesterone high and estrogen a little bit lower to see if an egg implants into this lining. If there's no egg that implants into the lining, there's no signal of any implantation of any pregnancy, then this progesterone and estrogen levels are going to drop dramatically. And this dr sudden drop of these hormones is what basically triggers your first your bleeding and your menstrual phase again. Um, so on an interesting side note, a lot of your birth control pills are hormonal based. They capitalize on this right here. So basically, um, your birth control pill um, allows you to have an elevated amount of progesterone over estrogen. And um, that basically keeps your body thinking it's right here in this phase, looking to see if you're pregnant, except it lasts like all month long because you're taking it synthetically as a pill. So basically, it spends the whole month thinking it might be pregnant. It kind of builds a uterine wall, but eh, not read it really. And the bleeding that you have if you're on a birth control pill or on a hormonal cycle is called breakthrough bleeding, and it's not actually from a true building of a uterine lining. It's really interesting to go see how some of these uh, work. Um, there are also various types of progesterone on the market in these birth control pills. I know there's at least four different types out there, and um, they're all different molecules. And that's why sometimes one birth control pill may work for one woman and not for another, or they may just feel like crap on it or something like that. So some of it has to do with the composition of those um, birth control pills. But anyway, so the, the idea of progesterone is progesterone is needed to maintain the pregnancy and for implantation and all of that so progesterone is a think of it as a pregnancy um, well you need it for pregnancy you need to have enough progesterone and so we're going to talk about fertility and other things here in a little bit but um, I just thought I'd talk about that and then um, one of the ways some of these like implants and stuff work is um, they did the pill even though technically you could just be on the pill all the time and not have that weak break where you have that breakthrough bleeding. They um, women thought it was disturbing to not have that monthly rhythm of having a period, so they built in that fake week of sugar pills so that you have breakthrough bleeding, so that you think you have a normal period when you actually are not really having a normal period. Uh, but like physiologically, if you want, I mean, you could take it all the time and never have that breakthrough bleeding and you just basically keep your body in this state right here all the time there's some uh, drawbacks to that but um, you probably just want to go do your own research we could be talking for hours on that so uh, let's not do that uh, let me see. okay sorry about that. that is not what I meant to do just looking for my little arrows here there they are okay so uh, let's talk a little bit about the male system, much, much, much more simpler than the female system. Um, so they have reproductive and urinary structures are shared and um, exit out the penis, of course. Um, they uh, have um, gonadotropin releasing hormone begins the process um, of maturation into a fully functional male, just like it does in the female. So it begins the process of puberty. Uh, and those gonadotropin, they also have LH and FSH. And uh, LH, luteinizing hormone, uh, in the male stimulates testosterone production. And uh, I forgot to mention also LH in the female, luteinizing uh, hormone, um, the, the follicle becomes the uh, corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum produces the progesterone. And so the luteinizing hormone, after it's peaked, it basically causes the production of um, the corpus luteum, which gives uh, that increase in progesterone. So side note here. And then FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, which of course is named after what it does um, in uh, the follicles of the, you know, the female and the ovaries. Um, it, um, it, along with testosterone, initiates the production of sperm. So spermatogenesis is what it does. Um, and uh, there's a negative feedback loop for um, 
testosterone production and stuff. Just a sec. All right, those are all the effects of testosterone. Y'all just ignore my dog barking. Okay, sorry about that. I had to pause it for a minute because they were just being crazy because somebody was walking down the road. Anyway, so let's look at the effects of testosterone. There are many, many effects of testosterone in the male body. Um, so let's let's start here. Intrauterine differentiation. So the production of testosterone by the baby, by the baby boy, um, will cause um, the development of the male features um, of a baby. And so um, often if a um, woman's been pregnant with a boy and with a girl, they'll tell can tell you the different there's a difference in the pregnancy and part of that has to do with the hormones that are present so um there's a lot more testosterone floating around if you're pregnant with a boy because that testosterone is being produced by the little boy so that he can differentiate and develop penis and scrotum and urethra prostate and all that kind of stuff um but testosterone along with dihydrotestosterone and then this form of estrogen e2 form of estrogen uh, there are multiple forms of estrogen also by the way um gives you a feedback suppression of the gonadotropin um, secretion so there is this fe negative feedback loop again for testosterone levels which testosterone levels are always higher in the morning and lower in the evening in males that have this kind of daily cycle of um, level going on um, and um, the testosterone also imprints male pattern of gonadotropins in sex drive and behavior so a lot of the male behavior, the um, protector functions, the risk-taking behaviors and all that are all testosterone driven. Um, I like to jokingly say, and some of you guys will get this and I'll explain it. It's kind of like uh, to, a lot of testosterone is will drive these hold my beer moments, which for your Chinese students, uh, my Chinese students, that means basically, uh, if anybody says that, they're usually fixing to do something really, really stupid and really, really risky. So um, anyway, testosterone drives these kinds of behaviors in men. And if uh, men have lower testosterone levels, they'll tend to be more chill and not have those same kinds of behavior. Uh, it gives uh, them a deeper voice. Um, it also gives them stronger bones and skeleton. Uh, and a lack of testosterone, a low testosterone will uh, cause them to develop abdominal visceral fat. Um, and having enough testosterone uh, will give them plenty of muscle mass to have a, it's what drives their bigger muscle mass and they'll have more red cells uh, to maintain that muscle mass too. Um, in the liver, um, having um, not enough testosterone will actually give uh, drive this type of uh, low uh, HDL, high LDL kind of pattern. Uh, having enough testosterone in DHT and E2 is required also for sperm production and uh, doing pubertal development for uh, maturation of the penis and seminal vesicles and all of that. And also, of course, the DHT, the dihydrotestosterone develops prostate um, and they can have too much and have an enlarged prostate also. There's some problems there. Um, and beard growth and uh, sebum, sebum formation. So the, the, the greasiness of the, um, and the sebum there in the beard and other hair and all of that. So that gives you kind of an overview of everything that testosterone does for the guys. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to get this. There you go, to switch. All right, let's talk infertility. So um, primary infertility is a couple with uh, no successful pregnancies. So they've been trying for a while and they aren't getting pregnant. Secondary infertility, the couple has had a baby before or had a previous conception. Uh, even let's say that um, even if the pregnancy wasn't viable all the way, they've at least conceived it at least once, um, but then they're not able to conceive currently. Uh, it is often caused by a dysfunction of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So we have talked about this axis before, well kind of, we've alluded to it in the endocrine chapter. So, uh, yes, so that's the, the talk between the hypothalamus that produces the gonadotropin releasing hormones, right? And it talks to the pituitary, which releases LH and FSH. And then the LH and the LH and FSH talk to the gonads, which are the ovaries and, uh, the testicles. And then, um, those produce either the testosterone or the estrogen and all the hormones. Okay. So somewhere in this axis, something is going wrong. And that is why there's infertility. 
Okay, for um, this case right here, uh, I'll probably just move my little thing here. So, um, 26 year old Fred and 24 year old Jonna are unable to conceive. They've had unprotected intercourse for about 18 months with no resulting pregnancy. So that's uh, an average time. So they, they want usually more than a year of trying, a year to year and a half of trying and, you know, with no pregnancy. Both are avid runners and participate in marathons four times a year. So that indicates like they're healthy, very active young adults. Okay. So Fred's fertility workup is completely normal. So what would that entail? I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, but basically to look at a semen analysis and make sure that um, his, he's got plenty of sperm and that they're swimming and modal and doing all the things they're supposed to do. Okay, so um, Jonna's workup came back with an FSH level of greater than 40 international units per liter. It's not supposed to be that high. And she had the FSH drawn a month earlier with the same results. So she has two FSH levels that are extremely high. So if you think about that, follicle stimulating hormones really high. So what is it trying to do? It's trying to stimulate the ovaries to produce eggs. And obviously it's not working because she's not able to conceive. So what condition accounts for the couple's inability to conceive? We'll answer that in a minute. And should more tests be ordered? So yeah, probably going to want to do some more tests on that one. Okie dokie, let me... Sorry, going the wrong way. Okie dokie. All right, let's talk about male infertility first. So, of course, Fred's was fine, but sometimes there's problems with male infertility. So, um, causes of male infertility are basically anything that will affect the testosterone production can cause infertility. So, because testosterone drives the production of sperm, if testosterone is, le is low, the sperm won't be produced. Um, the, a common cause of male infertility is congenital idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. That is a mouthful. So what does this mean? Okay, congenital means they're born with it. Idiopathic, we have no idea what the cause is. Could be something that the baby was exposed to, to uh, in utero from the mom. Who knows, right? Um, Hypogonadotropic, so hypo means low, and the gonadotropins are uh, GnRH and then LH and FSH. So not enough of these guys are being produced, which then of course results in hypogonadism. What are the gonads for a male be the testi testes, so underdeveloped testes. Um, and so um, because of that, they can't make sperm. And if they can't make sperm, they're not fertile. Uh, the hypogonadism itself can be congenital, as seen here, or acquired. Uh, so acquired would be through different diseases uh, and stuff. So how do we evaluate male fertility? Obviously, just like I stated, uh, a semen analysis is the main way. And we can also do hormone levels. So we can check the free and total testosterone and LH and FSH. And we can look for an antisperm antibody that would be produced uh, in the uh, female then and affect uh, the pregnancy uh, you know, outcome here. So um, I know you can't see this little part here. Actually, let me see if I can move it up again. There we go. There we are. So the um, uh, history, we get a history and physical examination of the male. Okay, so let's start here. If it is abnormal, so let's say, oh, we uncover he's got cardiovascular disease or he has tap 2 diabetes or something like that. First, you really want to treat that. You want to get that under control because that could just be the cause right there. Okay, so uh, let's say this is a healthy male and everything on history and physical exam is fine. Then we do the semen analysis. If it is normal, then um, we can do some what we call postcoital testing. So yeah, that's testing right after sex. Um, and um, look for antisperm antibodies and sperm mucus penetration and all that to evaluate, see what's going on there. So maybe he's making enough sperm, but then the mom's, you know, the woman's body is attacking it or something. Okay, so let's say the semen analysis is abnormal. So he's either not making enough sperm or the sperm quality is really low. Uh, so if it's abnormal, let's repeat test. Uh, if we repeat the test and it's normal, then it should be fine. Uh, and, but if you get two abnormal um, sperm uh, samples back to back, then we need to evaluate the hormones, LH, FSH, and testosterone. And then here, depending on the patterns that you see, you have different interpretations. So 
if you have low LH, low FSH, and low testosterone, then we are uh, at hypothalamic or pituitary failure. So the testosterone is not being made because LH and FSH are not being made, right? Um, if the LH and FSH are high and uh, the testosterone is high, we have gonadal failure. So all the hormones are there, just the sperm, the gonads, the testes just aren't producing. Uh, if you have normal LH, high FSH, and normal testosterone, um, it's the germinal compartment that is failing and is damaged. If you have high LH, uh, normal FSH, and normal or high testosterone, it could be androgen resist resistance. And if you have normal LH, normal FSH, and normal testosterone, then it's what we call idiopathic, which means we don't know. All right, female infertility. The causes are many and varied also. The most common cause is a failure to ovulate. And the failure to ovulate can have various, various causes. This is actually what's going on with our little case. The female is not ovulating. One of the causes of this could be her marathon running. So um, interestingly enough, you're, um, sometimes if you're too athletic or do too many maybe extreme sports, um, you know, endurance sports and stuff like that, and you have extremely low body fats, um, it is possible that you just simply don't have the ideal conditions to bear a child, and so um, your body just will not ovulate. So um, you're, in females, your primary function that your body looks at and tries to maintain is that of reproduction, is the ability to have a child and stuff. And so um, if you don't have enough body fat or you're not eating enough and stuff like that, or... Um, you're fasting or there's all kinds of different things that can uh, your body can perceive as um, it's a dangerous time to be pregnant and so because there's not enough resources and they're just going to it's just going to just stop the ovulation because um, it's not it, it perceives that it's not a good idea for you to be pregnant so you could potentially make also uh, anti-sperm antibodies which would prevent you then of course from being pregnant um, so the lab evaluations of female infertility um, also starts with a medical history and physical exam. In primary ovarian failure, uh, you would see two FSH levels of greater than 30. In our uh, case, she had greater than 40 and she had two of them one month apart. So she would have primary ovarian failure. Um, and uh, we can ass assess ovulation and luteal functions and stuff. So we can see, uh, you can actually do these tests and do them over like an entire cycle. So you, you start at the first day of the period and then you go all the way through collecting samples every few days and you can actually check the pattern of how the, the estrogen curve is going up and down, how the, the progesterone is coming up, what's LH and FSH doing and all of that. So there's a way to pattern all of that. Um, ovulation is usually um, specifically evaluated by progesterone um, and you need progesterone levels of greater than four nanograms to indicate normal ovulation you know and potential uh, for successful pregnancy. So same kind of graph here so starts with history physical exam pap smear etc cetera, etc. Cetera. If um, there's a problem there then you will first want to treat maybe there's an infection maybe there's some scarring maybe whatever so first let's look at those other causes but if all of that's normal um and is the menses regular or irregular if you have regular menses so a 20 kind of 28 to 38 day cycle uh that's very predictable and all of that so then we can uh go and evaluate uh, basal, basal body temperature, luteinizing hormone, midluteal serum, progesterone, and all of that. And from there, we can see, um, are you ovulating, are you ovulatory, or are you not ovulating and ovulatory? So if you are ovulating, you can do a postcoital test. If it's normal, uh, continue intercourse for a year. Uh, and if you're still not pregnant, refer to a specialist. If it's abnormal, then it could be that you have that anti-sperm antibody and uh, you might have to um, evaluate the male or other factors and stuff like that. Okay. If you are not ovulating, they can do a progestins challenge. And if it is normal, uh, you can induce ovulation and uh, consider um, a resistant ovary syndrome. Um, and if the progestin challenge is abnormal, uh, consider if uh, the thyroid, prolactin, 
um, testosterone, LH, uh, all that to differentiate. So these are all things that should be checked. Your, believe it or not, and we talked about thyroid last week. Your, your, in females, your thyroid health affects your reproductive health very, very um, tightly. I mean, it's very, they, they're both related. So if your thyroid stuff is out of whack, your reproductive stuff is going to be out of whack too. So there's a bunch of different conditions here listed. You can go back and see. Um, and again, if you have an irregular menses, you can also do the progestin uh, challenge, and you can follow the algorithms there too uh, in your book. Okay, so let's talk amenorrhea. So that is um, no period. So you you don't have a period. You don't have a cycle. Uh, and so obviously that would be a problem because then you, you, one, you don't know when you're ovulating or if you're ovulating and you're not going to be able to get pregnant. So uh, primary amenorrhea has genetic conditions um, and it can also be due to uh, hypothalamic dysfunction. So if something has damaged your hypothalamus, um, and or even you pituitary, then you can have primary amenorrhea. So um, if you remember, when we talked in the endocrine system, your pituitary can be damaged by, you know, like a blow to the head or trauma to the head or something like that. Okay. Secondary amen amenorrhea is usually secondary to other chronic medical conditions. Uh, it can be secondary to eating disorders, depression, uh, excessive exercise and all that. So that would go back to, again, the low body fats. Uh, hormone imbalances, you know, eating disorders, your body is going to perceive that you're starving or that there's a problem getting enough food. If there's a problem getting enough food, well, we don't need to have a cycle or have a period or have a baby. So uh, if this is kind of obvious, the first thing you probably should do if, especially if a female had periods on a regular basis and now she's not having a period, well, let's see if she's pregnant first, right? So first, first let's rule out the, the obvious. Is the female pregnant? Okay. If that's been ruled out, um, then you can do uh, thyroid hormone testing, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone testing to see what's going on. Uh, if chronic disease is suspected, you can do a sed rate, CBC, liver function test, BUN, creatinine, urinalysis, and all of that, and other hormone studies. So you've got to really start investigating uh, the cause of the amenorrhea. So here in your book, there's, uh, again, um, a chart of the different causes of primary or secondary amenorrhea. So again, primary could have genetic or hypothalamic kind of failure causes. Secondary is usually secondary to another condition, like anorexia nervosa, weight loss, strenuous exercise, and stuff like that, systemic diseases and all that. There's also a post-pill amenorrhea, post-birth control pill. Um, look at post-birth control pill syndrome. It's really interesting. Um, so sometimes, yeah, coming off of birth control, you can have problems getting everything started again uh, for the reasons of how the birth control pill works. Um, and so you can go down um, Cushing's disease, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, hypo or hyperthyroidism. Again, if your thyroid's out of whack, your reproductive system is going to be out of whack. Um, and just all kinds of stuff. Some of them, if you notice, are on both sides. So if you have hypothyroidism, you can also have primary amenorrhea. Um, and there's some again here like congenital adrenal hyperplasia and others are some that are, that are common to both. Uh, ovarian failure uh, is on both also um, and prolactinoma is on both. So anyway, it's definitely for uh, somebody who really knows what they're doing, a specialist to go investigate um, all of this and it's, it's pretty complex. Okay, let's talk about hirsutism. So that is excessive hair growth in women. And it's not about having some nice, pretty long, luscious hair. It's about having hair growing where it's not supposed to be growing. Uh, also known often as the bearded ladies, right? So we have a certain see facial hair here, you know, mustache and stuff uh, in a kind of a male pattern. Uh, and you may even have deepening of the voice and stuff. And some of them, they might even actually lose some of the hair up here. This might be thinner. So uh, it's usually caused by increased androgen levels. And your androgens are your testosterone, DHEA, and all of that. So they're the andro, the male hormones. That's what androgens are. And this androgen excess can be caused by many things. Severe insulin resistance. So if the type 2 diabetics it can, uh, do that. Androgen producing tumors, menopause, and polycystic ovary syndrome. We'll look at some of those here in a minute. And your lab testing will confirm excess androgen and can identify the source of the androgens, either adrenal or ovarian. Elevated DHES usually indicates an adrenal source. 
of those androgens. Okay, Kleinfelter syndrome is a genetic disorder, and you have karyotype 47, uh, and it's an XXY. So you have two X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And uh, this, um, these um, babies or these people will then have physical and cognitive abnormalities. And it is a form of primary testicular failure, uh, and you have to have cytogenetic testing to determine that, but they would be uh, infertile. Kalman syndrome is a rare genetic disorder uh, where you have um, gonadotropin-releasing hormone deficiency. So uh, at the hypothalamus level, we're not making GnRH, right? And one of the hallmark findings is hyposmia hypos or anosmia, which means a lack of sense of smell or a very, very low sense of smell. And part of that is because that region of your brain that interprets smell and the region that of the hypothalamus kind of develop at the same time. And so if they're, they both seem to be impacted at the same time. So um, patients that have idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism could have a normal sense of smell. Uh, so the lab tests that we do, uh, males with either the common or the idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism will have low levels of both free and total testosterone, and the females will have low estradiol levels. All right, or orchitis and epididymitis. So uh, orchitis is the testes inflammation. So this part uh, here, these are the testes, uh, usually causes by viruses or bacteria. The most common is caused by mumps, which is uh, a virus. And then epididymitis, is, this is where the epididymis is, right here, leading to the vas deferens. Uh, and it's an, obviously an inflammation of the epididymis and it's usually caused by an infectious agent. And you would do UA, CBC, urethral cultures, and syphilis and HIV testing to find a cause. All right, menopause um, happens when the circulating reproductive hormone levels start decreasing. Uh, and it's part of the ceasing of the reproductive age. Uh, so the periods are uh, stop um, and their reproductive capability ends because you're not ovulating anymore. There is a perimenopausal period, so a, a period, if you will, around menopause where um, the period starts to basically lessen uh, in you know duration and in frequency and stuff like that. Um, you see, obviously, an estrogen deficiency, so the estrogen levels start to drop, and that could lead to osteoporosis. Um, if you measure the hormones, they would have high FSH levels, uh, and those are diagnostic markers for ovarian fa failure, but also uh, are typical um, to, to menopause. So uh, high LH and FSH um, are diagnostic of menopause, but are rarely, you rarely need to have both tested. And they rarely actually do the blood test. But, you know, maybe if you go through early menopause and you're wondering what's going on, they could do the testing there to do, determine that. Okay, let's talk about polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, it's also known as stain leventhal syndrome, and it's characterized by insulin resistance and high insulin levels. Um, there's usually an excessive androgen uh, hormones. Again, the androgens are the male hormones. And... Um, there will be high lipid levels, uh, so triglycerides, LD, um, LDL, and all of that, with a high risk of cardiovascular disease, obviously associated with that pattern, and high luteinizing hormone levels that uh, lead to the high testosterone and androstenedione levels. PCOS patients usually have abnormalities in the metabolism of androgens and estrogens and in the control of androgen production. So the metabolism is so normally as you produce these androgens and estrogens, uh, your liver should break them, break them down and clear them through your gut. And this is where a good gut health is actually very important to hormonal health, because uh, you have to have enough fiber and stuff to, act, to pick up these uh, hormones and move them out of your body through poop. And if you don't, you can actually reabsorb them through GI absorption and it can recirculate and then you would have excess, you know, excess, androgens and estrogens and stuff, which can lead to weight gain and all kinds of problems. Um, so uh, total and free testosterone levels are performed as well as uh, the androstenedione, um, FSH and LH, and they're done to assess uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. So uh, the different testosterone procedures we can do, um, so free testosterone is unattached to protein, so it's free, obviously. Uh, it can be weakly bound to albumin or tightly bound to sex binding, um, sex hormone binding globulin. 
Um, to total testosterone, they're usually performed by immunoassays or liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. The free testosterone is usually uh, performed by our uh, radioimmunoassay. The sex hormone binding globulin can be measured by immunoassay or liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And uh, there are panels available that give total testosterone, free testosterone, um, sex hormone binding globulin, albumin, and bioavailable testosterone uh, results that are very helpful. Um, DHEA or dehydroapiandrosterone um, sterone, sorry, is uh, DHEA and DHEAS. Um, they can gauge the production of your adrenal androgens. So if you remember in our uh, endocrine chapter, the adrenal glands also make androgens. So that, that is why in a, a female can have um, testosterone levels um, because um, the, the adrenal glands make your androgens, your testosterone levels, and the males can also have estrogen and progesterone and stuff. So um, anyway, uh, adrenal androgens um, are, can be made and both DHEA and DHEAS are commonly performed uh, as an immunoassay procedure and, for example, would be used to assess polycystic ovary syndrome, but other also. But the 17 ketosteroids in the urine are the metabolites of testosterone and they're secreted by the testes and adrenal glands. So um, they would be decreased in primary hypogonadism and increase in testicular uh, tumors, adrenal carcinomas, and adrenal hyperplasia. And it is definitely a specialized test, but it can be done. So estrogen and progesterone can be evaluated, uh, especially in the females. So the estrogens, remember, it's just an S. There are quite a few different types of estrogens. Uh, the most common method for uh, evaluation of some of these molecules is immunoassay. The most accurate is GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And the reference ranges are totally based on the menstrual cycle, so you have to know when in a menstrual cycle uh, this sample was drawn. The progesterone is used to evaluate of ovulation. So remember, after ovulation, progesterone levels start to increase, um, and um, they will um, decrease if pregnancy does not occur, they drop right before the bleeding, and they are necessary to maintain that early pregnancy. So we would want to assess progesterone level because if a woman uh, does not make enough progesterone, like she could be making an egg and releasing the egg, and the egg is fertilized, but it just either implants or can't stay implanted because there's not enough progesterone. And so you can cause early miscarriage or just a failure to implant and to therefore have a successful pregnancy. Uh, the immunoassay is the most common method to assess progesterone. And the progesterone levels are often ordered along with HCG levels if there's a suspicion that uh, a woman might be losing a pregnancy. All right, LH and FSH. Um, uh, usually you want to assess LH as the mid-cycle surge of LH, um, and if it helps confirm uh, when ovulation should occur. Um, FSH controls the development and maturation of the follicle, so it rises earlier on in the cycle. And uh, it is Worth noting for the, both of these hormones, the alpha units are identical, so you have to uh, able, be able to measure the beta subunits because that's what differentiates LH and FSH. The reference range are also based on where in the menstrual cycle a woman is, and you perform them by immunoassay or liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. So let's talk pregnancy. Pregnancy is chapter 26. All right. So your female uh, and the female's ovaries release one ovum, one egg per month. That's average. This is usually normal, though it's possible sometimes that uh, two can be released and stuff. This is how you get fraternal twins. Uh, and fer fertilization will happen in a fallopian tube. So um, it takes about a week for the egg to uh, travel from the time it's released from the ovary, travel all the way down to uh, the uterus. And so, um, and it has to be fertilized within a few days. So the sperms have to swim all the way pretty much up to the top third of the fallopian tube to find the egg and to fertilize it. Um, if the egg is fertilized, then it will implant in the uterine wall. Um, so a few days later, a week after the ovulation, and it will start implanting these chorionic villi into the uterine wall, which will turn into the placenta. The placenta attaches the fetus and the umbilical cord to the uterus. The placenta is how the fetus gets its nutrients and uh, also is in charge of removing the waste 
that are produced by metabolism of the fetus and it also produces hormones which we'll look at in a second and there's also amniotic fluid that is produced uh, around the baby that bathes the baby the the fetus floats, is floating around in amniotic fluid so let's look at the hormones of pregnancy so the main pregnancy hormone is the human chorionic gonadotropin or hcg that is the pregnancy hormone that we measure and that indicates elevated levels indicate that a woman is pregnant uh, and it stimulates progesterone production to maintain the pregnancy and then of course you can pr progesterone is the other one and what progesterone does is it suspends menstruation to maintain pregnancy uh, and again, uh, that's also the suspension of menstruation also means suspension of ovulation, which is why progesterone is used in a lot of birth control pills and other hormonal methods of birth control. The uh, human placental lactogen is another hormone that is produced. It uh, modifies the metabolic state of the mother during the pregnancy to facilitate the energy supply to the fetus. So, um, this is why um, nutrition is super important when a woman is pregnant. It's not only because the baby needs it, but it's because of the two, baby is going to get the nutrients before mama does. And um, if mama doesn't get enough nutrients and um, vitamins and all of that, she could be really depleted after pregnancy. Um, so here are three of the forms of estrogens that, that are associated with pregnancy. We have estradiol, estriol, and estrone. And these are all involved in the endometrium and uterine growth and in the prep for labor. So by the way, labor starts initiating when the progesterone levels here start to drop um, and uh, the estrone levels are up. And so that starts initiating labor. So the amniotic fluid uh, provides a proper environment around the fetus and maintains a constant temperature. It transports some of the nutrients and electrolytes into the fetal circulation. Uh, and the baby's always actually constantly swallowing the amniotic fluid and peeing it out, okay? The amniotic volume varies, um, also depends on the pregnancy, uh, how far along, if there's one or two babies and all kinds of stuff, so. Um, the, um, it, you can sample some amniotic fluid and measure the phospholipids. Um, the phospholipids present in the um, amniotic fluid reflect lung maturity. So usually we measure lecithin and sphingomyelin and phosphatidylglycerol are all used to assess uh, fetal lung maturity. Uh, fetal lungs are really aren't ready and mature until about week 36. And so if we may have to have a early delivery, we want to be able to assess fetal lung maturity and intervene if needed. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Meconium is the first bowel movement of the baby. Sometimes that can happen uh, during birth or in the amniotic fluid. And so that could be a problem because then it can be, uh, it can enter inside the baby, like they can swallow it or something during birth. Um, so that would, it's usually not a good thing. So uh, laboratory conf confirmation of pregnancy. So we obviously, just as I mentioned, detect the beta subunit of HCG. It's a beta HCG. We can do it on serum or on urine. So the test, the pregnancy test that you can buy at the stores obviously use urine, um, but you can draw blood if you went to a doctor's office or to in an ER or clinic or something like that. And it's actually the same kind of test, usually this qualitative positive negative. Um, so there is, you can do a quantitative also to get a specific level of HCG. Um, so, uh, most physicians do want, early on want to know the HCG levels, the quantity to see if it is, um, rising appropriately and to aid in the determination of the week of pregnancy to see how far along they are. Um, quantitative assays are usually performed on an immunoassay analyzer and, uh, HCG will peak at a hundred thousand, um, at the end of the first trimester so it rises quite a bit really high uh, all the way up to the end of the first trimester and then kind of levels off and then starts starts kind of going down all right julie's case let's look at julie she's a 25 year old pregnant woman who goes to a physician for her first prenatal care visit her provider orders prenatal lab work um, a glucose a urinalysis electrolytes our rpr test for syphilis a torch titer and uh, which is toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, HSV, and HIV, a vaginal cultures, and a typing screen. 
Her fasting blood glucose level is 140. What should the provider order next? And what disease should would um, should he suspect? And I'm sorry, y'all. Bryant Katie is being a butt and meowing. Hang on. Okay, so let's look at uh, Julie's case. So more than likely, she would have gestational diabetes. So that should be what you'd have thought of. Um, usually the glucose, though, is not drawn on the first prenatal visit. It's usually drawn between 24 and 28 week pregnancy, but they can, they can check one early on also. Uh, the glucose tolerance test for pregnancy would be what you would follow up with uh, if you have just a random glucose that's elevated, which she had it. Uh, and the typical one for pregnancy is a three-hour glucose tolerance test, although different clinics may have different protocols. Um, and if two values exceed normal in a three-hour GTT, the patient is positive or we suspect gestational diabetes. Um, many physicians will perform simply a one-hour postprandial glucose test on pregnant women. It's a lot more convenient. Uh, so basically either give them a meal or, you know, they eat or to eat, uh, get a dose and you check it an hour later. Um, if this level is really high above a certain cutoff, then you can proceed to an oral glucose tolerance test, or at least you can be suspecting gestational diabetes. Uh, another complication in pregnancy is ectopic pregnancy. So um, the fertilized egg can implant outside of the uterus, usually in a fallopian tube. Uh, the fallopian tube is not maintained, not uh, built to maintain pregnancy. Um, the symptoms would be lower abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, and cessation of menses, and the causes are usually a da damaged fallopian tubes, and they would be damaged by uh, repeated um, sexually transmitted infections such as gonorrhea that just end up leading to scarring of the fallopian tubes. That's one of the causes anyway, it's the predominant cause of it. Um, the diagnostic test, um, we would do serial quantitative HCG levels to confirm an ectopic pregnancy with some ultrasounds and all of that and to monitor the removal of the fertilized egg from the fallopian tube. Um, hyperemesis gravidarum is another complication. My sister actually had that. And it's a severe form of nausea and vomiting beyond just normal, like what we call morning sickness. Okay, um, there's uh, an imbalance in acid base and electrolytes, um, and there are nutritional deficits. So because they're they're literally um, not eating and they're throwing everything up, and so you see weight loss and ketosis, um, and um, so they're not because they're not eating enough. Plus they're throwing up. They're, they're it's messing up their electrolytes. They're losing too much of the acids and stuff, um, but also um, they're producing excess acids from ketosis and they're use, losing some of their um, back carb through so the, the vomiting and stuff. So they're, yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty bad. So the symptoms of nausea, vomiting, fatigue, dizziness, depression, and anxiety. And your lab test, you would do UA, CBC, BMP, LFT, liver function test, hepatitis, amylase, lapase, TSH, urine culture. So basically, why would you do all that? You're going to make sure they don't have an infection. You're going to make sure that you're going to check their electrolytes here to make sure they don't have problems with their liver or hepatitis or other causes of this nausea and vomiting and fatigue and all that. And the ketones here will be elevated. And it's because they're just they're, they're starving, basically, because they're not getting any kind of nutrition. So they're having to burn their store fat stores to get some kind of energy going. And um, everything that basically goes into their mouth comes right back out. Um, and so you usually treat uh, treat them with fluids and some certain anti-nausea medicines and um, try to get them their ketones down and where they can, you know, feel better and maybe try to eat and keep some fluids down. Um, another complication is preeclampsia. You have uh, high blood pressure and proteinuria, and um, the proteinuria is three plus on two random specimens after the 20th week. It can be severe. Uh, the risk factors for preeclampsia are being more than 40 years old, of black race, having a family history of it, having chronic renal disease, chronic hypertension, diabetes, twins, or a high BMI. The only treatment for preeclampsia is the delivery of the baby. If the delivery happens, has to happen before 37 weeks, the fetal lung maturity screen uh, is, I mean, it must be done and fetal lung maturity is a concern. 
Um, you can give corticosteroids to the mom to try to mature up the baby's lungs before delivery. The lab test that you would run would be uh, urine protein, which would be elevated, CBC, AST, ALT, serum uric acid, and creatinine, all of those to assess um, liver function and stuff. And you would expect some of these to be elevated if they have preeclampsia. And then eclampsia is a complication of preeclampsia, and this is what you're trying to avoid. Uh, it's very rare in the United States, but it can lead to, the preeclampsia basically can lead to grand mouth seizures uh, into a coma. Um, there usually is intracranial hemorrhage, um, and it can also lead to death. Um, it is associated with teen moms and mothers over the age of 35, and is associated with those who lack prenatal care, it's more often seen in like third world countries. Another complication is the HELP syndrome. Uh, it is a life-threatening complication of pre or manifestation of preeclampsia. This is where you see hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet counts. That's what the HELP stands for. So if you have thrombocytopenia and DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is a very dangerous uh, phenomenon where uh, your blood is making microclots all over the place. It uses up all your platelets and ties up a lot of your red cells and a lot of your clotting factors and then you have a bleeding. Um, it's not a good thing. Uh, this happens usually between the 27th and the 36th week and it can occur also after delivery. Uh, the symptoms are right upper quadrant pain, malaise, nausea, vomiting, headache, and jaundice. And your lab results, uh, other than the low platelet, you would ha have a high LDH, high AST, and high ALT. And you would see hemolyzed serum also. Uh, the fetal complications, we have neural tube defects. Uh, those are abnormalities of the fetal central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. Um, it's a failure of the neural tube to fuse, or basically of the spinal cord and spinal column to close. In spina bifida, you have a meningeal myelocele. Uh, the bottom of the neural uh, tube does not fuse, so part of the spinal cord is protruding out of uh, the spinal column. Uh, and encephalocele, uh, the sac containing the brain and the membranes protrudes through an opening in the skull. And anencephaly, um, you have a lack of parts of the brain and the skull. Uh, they all correlate with folic acid deficiency. Folic acid uh, is a nutrient that comes from foliage or leafy stuff, so you'll eat your leafy greens. Um, you can also take folic acid supplementation if you're trying to get pregnant to make sure you have enough folic acid on board for your baby. Uh, and you would um, screen via AFP levels done uh, on women um, during the triple or quad screen, usually in the second trimester of pregnancy. Um, so Down syndrome has a fetal complication. They have an extra copy of the long arm of chromosome 21. Their characteristics include mental retardation, hypotonia, congenital heart defects, and a flat facial profile. The screenings, both the triple screen and quad screen, include data about the risk of fetal Down syndrome. And if it is abnormal, usually they want to do further testing, usually a chromosomal analysis with amniocentesis. Uh, so another fetal complication is uh, respiratory distress syndrome. So this is definitely uh, common in preterm delivery. Uh, the march of dimes is to help uh, preemies and try to help stop too many pre preemie being born, as in trying to have all babies carried to full term, right? But then for those that are preemies to have resources available to them and to the families. So um, the lungs cannot produce an, enough of the pulmonary surfactant uh, because the baby was born too early, usually before 30, that's 36, 30, 37th week. And so when uh, they breathe out, their little alveoli is supposed to stay open, collapse down because the surfactant keeps the alveoli open. So your symptoms of that, you'll see hyperventilation in the baby with or without cyanosis that would be a the baby turns blue or has blue lips and um, fingers and uh, toes and stuff you'll see nasal flaring so their little little um nostrils are open really wide and exhalation grunting they go and intercostal retraction so basically all of these like indicate what we call labor of breathing it's hard for the little babies they're really trying to suck air in and you can see they're really struggling to breathe
The, we do the fetal lung maturity test to see if this is going to be a, pro, a problem. The current practice is to perform a, a phosphatidyl glycerol test with PG as a screen. And if the test is negative or low positive, then a lecithin sphingomyelin ratio will be ordered. Um, if the lungs are deemed not mature enough, the mother can be given steroids in an effort, effort to mature up the lungs if they can keep the baby in. Um, if the baby is born, um, they can give um, some pulmonary surfactant to try to help uh, open up those alveoli and keep them open. Hemolytic disease of the newborn um, is when an RH negative mom has an RH positive child and she's been sensitized to the D antigen and she has antibodies to the D antigen. And um, usually uh, what happens is the second RH positive um, uh, fetus pregnancy with an RH positive fetus, the red cells of that second baby uh, are destroyed by the antibodies because they're IgG antibodies that can cross the placenta. And so the way you prevent that is at 28 weeks gestation, if you have an RH negative mom, you give anti-D to prevent this and you'll give it again usually after the child is born to you give it to the mom and so that's to keep her from developing antibodies to the d antigen and um then that saves her future babies um from a future you know in her future pregnancies from having hdn and uh the lab diagnosis of fetal abnormalities so you have um neural tube defects you will do the afp um reported as uh, the multiple of the median. Um, for the chromosomal abnormalities, you can do amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. And for the fetal lung maturity, usually it's on the amniotic fluid, you do a phosphatidylglycerol and less than sphingomyelin ratio to, uh, those are all the different ways you can diagnose different fetal uh, abnormalities. And of course, we mentioned the quad screen uh, and triple screen uh, done in the second week, uh, uh, sorry, second week, second term, um, of pregnancy, so the second trimester of pregnancy. And that is your last slide, and that was your lecture on pregnancy and reproductive diseases. Thanks for your kind attention.